merged department between Douglas County and City of Omaha. It was formed as part of the Interlocal in 2004. Uh, one of the challenges, and I'll touch on a little bit later, that we have is we do spend a lot of our uh, manpower uh, and workload working on a lot of city projects versus the county projects. So, you know, one of the struggles we have, obviously, from a manpower perspective, is spending that amount of time and working with the city departments don't always like to play by the rules. So, it's an ongoing challenge to educate, uh, especially with this day and age with a lot of grant funded uh, procurement and the, uh, what we've determined are. Uh, new um, expectations from the federal government in terms of how you spend money and, and show how you've utilized and follow the procurement process. Um, and this here, basically our mission statement, um, as you can see, basically it, it kind of talks to essentially what our role is. We're very much a, a support organization. And I would like to tell people kind of in a nutshell is purchasing, we don't necessarily tell people uh, what they can buy. It's certainly their budget. Uh, but we certainly tell them how the process is going through the process. We have a state statute as well as a city charter that we must follow in terms of the procurement process. So it's very important that we educate and continue to do so with our departments. Excuse me, can I ask a question right off the bat? I had someone who supplies uh, towels for paper towels. Mm -hmm. well, that's what we are talking about earlier. But anyway, somebody who supplies the equipment for that and the towels. And they said that they had, this is several years ago now, they had, uh, had gotten a a uh, bid that was written so that it only applied to one gender. Do you have any way of monitoring that uh, so that you don't have city employees or county employees uh, writing uh, specs that limit it to a certain company? Yeah, absolutely. What we do when we review the specifications, the buyer will make sure that we do everything we can to avoid that sort of appearance. So basically we're writing the specs for one vendor link point because obviously we want to be competitive. Certainly we want to get the best possible price and, and function, functionality of what we're purchasing. But yeah, again, we want to make it an open process and be very transparent. So we want to make sure those specifications do give everybody an equal opportunity to do. Can I, can I ask that you include a uh, attestation clause at the bottom saying that the person who I, so and so, who prepared this RFP, uh, you know, swears that uh, this bid is open and competitive, does not favor one vendor over another, and sign their name? I'd like to see that because um, uh, I think that would really things on, in a better perspective because I think it still goes on. I mean, sure. it's, it's hard to, it's impossible to stop. Yeah, it. I'll work with the county attorneys and see if that language is something that's reasonable. Yeah, maybe mention it to the city attorney too, but uh, the city, but I think it needs to be done. I think it would really clear the air. Not that I've heard anything lately, but no, it would help. No, that's, that's good like, Good feedback. Okay. Certainly that's Thanks. what we want to try to avoid. Thanks. Um, kind of a little different order here, but just wanted to kind of talk to some of the things from a technology perspective that we're working in process and we're trying to do moving forward. Uh, one of the things that I think, you know, I've been here now five years, um, amazingly enough, it's gone by really fast, I'm glad to be here. Um, technology is certainly way ahead of where we are in terms of the bid process, and, and part of that is I think due to the fact that the city's process of opening sealed bids and envelopes and that sort of thing is pretty uh, dated. We have many entities, including the city of Lincoln, Lancaster, that do an online bidding process where people are able to go ahead and submit their proposals online electronically. There's a deadline, everything is done, you know, full disclosure, everything's listed, they can provide their bid securities, everything is done basically through an online portal. The system we're currently using for our, which is Quest CDN that we utilize for our contracts that involve like construction and things like that, they're large uh, uh, documents that it's just impossible for us to put out on a website. Um, they have that functionality already in their portfolio. So that's something we can work with them towards uh, implementing down the road. Who, who did, you said City of Lincoln and who else? C uh, City of Lincoln Lancaster. They have a combined agency just like us. Okay. Um, so we're their combined purchasing agency and they have like an online bidding portal. Do you, know, do you know the software they use? Um, they have kind of a homegrown one, to be honest with you. It's fairly uh, pricey, but you know we've talked to them a little bit about it. I don't know if it necessarily works for our needs, but we will continue to work with them and like take a look at it and get closer to that. Um, it's going to it's going to take a lot of uh, uh, convincing on the city side, I think, to go away from the way they've always done things because the big committees have kind of combined nonetheless. Um, one of the things we're trying to do from a, a just being more efficient is we have county warehouse, as you know, that supports the various departments and specifically the health center directly as well as the youth center. Um, implementing a barcoding system so that we can manage the inventory more efficiently. We can turn the inventory quicker. We can track things. We can get rid of obsolete inventory. Uh, working with .com right now, we have a project. Uh, we do have money in our budget uh, where we're getting to the point now where we're just trying to figure out what's the best option for us so we can start working towards implementing that uh, early this uh, fiscal year coming up. Um, 
And one of the things, again, getting back to the fact that we are a, a combined agency, and one of the things that uh, Chair Morrison uh, mentioned often is trying to get to that point where we are fully integrated and fully part of a one organization. The purchasing is basically city county; it's not split. Uh, one of the things that we've had up until now is a two different purchasing manuals. Um, you know, and again, most of what we have to follow in terms of the guidelines are the same. There are certain different things, but we're working very strongly on getting this developed, uh, and we'll be implementing within the next month or so is a full manual that's going to cover both city and county, and then we'll start the education process with all the changes or any updates that occur with that. Will that be online or printed? It will be online, and it'll also be available uh, for those that want printed copies. <laughs> So that's something that we really feel strongly about. I think it's going to help us. Now, one of the things that we've done, I mentioned Lincoln Lancaster County. We met with them about a year and a half ago and some other folks from Lincoln uh, Public Schools, Lincoln Electric, UNL, um, and I'm trying to think some of the others, uh, Sarkey County. We started kind of a sharing sort of um, group where we talked about bid opportunities, different commodities that we all had experiences with. Uh, looking at ways, we've done a few of these where we've done fine posts, we've done some other things, and looked at gravel where we could do a combined bid. We're allowed to do so through the state statutes and the Joint uh, Powers Act. So what we can do is say, hey, we can leverage, we're going to purchase this many tons, you're going to purchase this many tons, we put it all together, we put a bid out, we can have differences in our specifications if they're locally required, uh, but then we would actually issue a, a contract separately from, say, Lincoln Lancaster County. So we're not tied in specifically legally, but we are still leveraging the, the quantities that we're purchasing. We can get that county to scale and get better pricing. And it's, it's so far, a lot of it's been just sharing and doing that sort of thing. But we had some opportunity where we have gotten some better pricing doing it. So that's something we continue to move forward with. We've had a good working relationship with, with all the folks. And we just we set up a website. We can we all share that. Um, Oracle, obviously, as we move forward, one of the things that uh, some of you in the room might be aware of, they're kind of in the planning stages of working through the next uh, version of Oracle, what's called uh, Fusion, uh, which is kind of a cloud-based version. Um, so one of the things that I'm looking to do is to try to continue to leverage the training opportunities for myself, my staff, as well as any time we have departments and new people coming in and new responsibilities. We continue to be directly involved in the training of those folks. Uh, we want to make sure that they're utilizing the system correctly and understand all the impacts of what they do and how they do it. Um, and then one of the other things we're doing is uh, we're one of basically two departments that actually have uh, anything currently still running on the mainframe. Um, we're utilizing the print shop next door uh, to per do these print tickets to basically fill out the departments that use their services, and those are still being run on a system called LGFS that's on the mainframe. So we're working, we've got another project in flow right now that's going to migrate that to more of a web-based process. So our folks uh, initially will be involved in that, but eventually we're going to go to more of a self-service approach where the departments themselves can go in and they'll place a print ticket and, and it will be run smoothly right through the website and then into Oracle and then it'll be built out from their department. So we're real excited about that. Uh, that's been a long time coming. Um, Jill mentioned the budget uh, information, so this is just a, kind of a screenshot here again talking and it's on the handouts that we sent you, uh, handed out to you as well. Uh, Headcount's staying pretty stable there. Uh, one of the things to kind of note is obviously we do have some amount of revenue, not real significant, but it, it tracks around 13, 14% because of the fact that we have, uh, uh, like he said, about 90% of our expense is always payroll. Um, probably one of the impact areas that we have, since we have a majority of our employees that do a lot of departments under, under uh, contracts uh, with the unions, you know, those are the things that you really can't control those expenses to, to a great extent. So we do everything we can on the back end. We try to control the other expenses that we can. And so this is just another look at specifically the overall budget with the, the revenue. And they came in within I'm guidelines. Yeah, we came in more specifically. Yeah, we are meeting targets. So um, I think that's really all I have. So we'll pass it on to John. You talk about the garage and general equipment. Good afternoon. Um, there's the, uh, the garage mission statement. Um, it kind of outlines what we do as a whole. Um, I think sometimes my guys don't appreciate it just because people take for granted the work that they do. And, but uh, I, I do think that uh, we continue to uh, make improvements as a whole. I think that um, uh, the, the staff that I've got out there um, seem to be pretty happy with the, the way things are going, the direction of the shop and such. So, 
some of the goals and objectives, I know last year we had some discussions about the fleet management uh, policy, fleet management council on that. Um, I do have a, a draft form of the fleet management policy uh, in, in under review right now. Um, Marianne, do you have the handout? Is the handout coming around? No, there should have been there yeah. should have been two separate that were handed out. Yeah. Oh, no. No. It, it says garage at the end of the purchasing. I think I, gave you, I think I gave you two. Garage. I need a purchasing one. Here's purchasing. Yeah, I need that. That's that's that. That. I got I got it. Okay, so we got the garage now. All right. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, it's okay. So, um, like I said, with the uh, there is a draft of the fleet management policy um, put together uh, that's currently being reviewed. Um, we, we had an audit about 17, 18 months ago, just to kind of go over the procedures and the things that were taking place, how we were doing operations. Um, Mike Warnicky found a lot of good things, found some things that maybe we should start tracking a little bit different. We've implemented all those as well. Everything's documented. I keep records of everything in the shop there. Um, one of the things that came up was the external agency's labor rate. Currently, right now, we have a $41 an hour labor rate. It's well below the industry standard for maintenance of any kind, whether it's on light duty equipment, whether it's on heavy equipment. With us internally, it really has no relevance because we're charging ourselves essentially. So the $41 rate, uh, the proposal was $91 will be the end state after a three-year phase in. So we would start with a $15 increase. I'm not tracking your help. Who are external agencies? Uh, ENSA, uh, Eastern Nebraska Office of Aging, okay. Eastern Nebraska Health Services, uh, Metro Area Planning. Yeah, that was we, they do, we do maintenance and repairs for them and fueling for their vehicles and equipment. So this is an income matter, not an not a expense? Yes, sir. That's okay. correct. I misunderstood that. Yes. That was expense. So what we are in turn doing is implementing a rate increase for those external agencies will in turn increase the revenue on the garage side. And as we get through the next slide, you'll see that we don't have a large generation of revenue just because we service primarily 90% 90, 90 of the county owned fleet. Uh, continue to reduce fleet average cost per mile. Uh, that's something that, uh, that we've done over the last three years uh, significantly. I think we're about 70% less than we were four years ago. There's a number of things that go into that, not only new equipment, we've purchased a lot of new equipment, phased out a lot of old equipment that required a lot of maintenance and service to upkeep. Fuel costs have gone down. Uh, we've shopped around a lot as far as um, oils, lubricants, parts, everything that we do as an operation. Uh, I don't like to get locked into a one-year or two-year contract or anything of that sort because it's more feasible for me to, hey, every three months you give me your best price. And, and, and vendors are starting to realize that uh, what may have been happening in the past where, you know, they slowly increase prices over the four or five-year term and no one's questioning it, and they continue to do it. So we've cut costs significantly across the board, which in turn has reduced revenue because we're not charging as much out. but. We've continued to maintain and stay under our uh, budget every year, which include this year as well. Do you, uh, getting, I guess, do you lease? You talk about continuing to reduce fleet average cost per mile. Are you, you I know you're sure you looked at leasing, uh, particularly heavy equipment. Uh, what about that? <coughs> the highway department is generally who deals with all the heavy okay. equipment, and they do use the lease program. We write, write specifications for them. They do okay. utilize it for some of the graders and the loaders and that okay. stuff. And, and it does make sense because there's a number of things that are included in that. The specifications written a sp specific way to cover maintenance and warranty and all that other stuff. But from a mere uh, light duty all the way through a medium duty pickup, it's really not feasible because we buy everything off state contract. So we get it twelve to fourteen thousand dollars under MSRP than what the average consumer would would cost them to go buy that vehicle or piece of equipment somewhere. I just saw some car come through that was like thirty thousand dollars for a Ford Fusion. Like, wow. Not not from us. I, I, I pay about fourteen eight for a wow. Fusion. That's, not, that's what I mean about that list that comes through while we're sitting there talking about other stuff. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so again, manage equipment, procurement, reassignment, disposal. Um, we've done that. Um, there's a surplus list that probably came by the board, I believe today it was on the agenda. Uh, those are vehicles that have just cost too much money to maintain them. Some of them are age, some of them are mileage. Some of them had significant repairs. 
Some of those you saw that maybe were a little bit newer piece of equipment. They were uninsured motorists that hit, that one of our law enforcement agencies uh, deputies hit that vehicle or were hit by another vehicle and they weren't insured and it's a total loss. We don't get any money for that and we do what we can to, to send it surplus. We utilize uh, public surplus, which is an online auction system now to try and recover some of that money. But that money does go back to the general fund. Do you allow uh, county departments to uh, uh, accept the transfer of a law enforcement vehicle into their fleet, or do you? What do you do with them? The reason I ask is that a long time ago, the city used to take their police cruisers and let the parks department have them. And of course, you're getting two miles to a gallon on those 700,000 horsepower engines. You know, we have a handful of the Crown Vicks remaining in service. Some are at the youth center. We leave the we leave the uh, partitions, the cage inserts. <laughs> The youth center can use those, the corrections center can, and they're just not getting a lot of mileage, but they make sense versus replacing with a brand new vehicle. So if it's something that was assigned to the patrol unit at the sheriff's department and we're getting ready to pull it out of service and replace it with a Ford Explorer police utility, absolutely. If the vehicle's in good shape, it's not costing us a ton of money to operate it, I can reassign it to, say, corrections, and they can use it to take people from corrections to the hospital. I'd be real curious to see if, they, if it really is efficient to do that. I would say based on the mere, the minimal amount of use, it absolutely is versus buying them a new vehicle at fifteen to $18,000 to have it sit and get 1,200 miles a year put on it. If that's what they're doing, that'd be fine. Go ahead. Yeah, um, what is the average age and average mile on a vehicle? Kind of like. Now, well, let's exclude the sheriff's department. Average age is right now is about five and a half years. That is the average as a whole. When I first started here about three, a little over three and a half years ago, we were at about nine years was the average age of the fleet. Um, average miles, I don't have that off the top of my head exactly what our total is as a fleet, uh, but I can get that to you. Yeah, I'd like to know how many miles an average vehicle puts on per year. I'm also curious whether I've read that the city is closing, I believe they're closing the 20 something, 26th and Lake, Lake Street uh, Public Works or garage, and they're moving it to someplace like 15th and Jane or something. 18th and Jane's, I yeah, believe. Which yeah. kind of blows my mind. But Really? But, Are you serious? Yeah. Yes, they just opened a fuel station over there. They're closing, um, every, moving cars, everything. I think everything from Lake is being wow. relocated. Yeah. Yes. And, I, and of course, 24, 26 and Lake is right on top of the interstate, so I don't know what they're thinking. But anyway. Well, no, no that, I'm going to just tell you that people have been asked for that for years because of the development possibilities of what. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. They want out of well, that's happening. Wow. Um, I wanted to ask uh, what is your relationship with the city garage? Anything at all? Very little. I mean, I. Um, I talked to uh, Mark quite a bit. Mark McCoy is their is their fleet management um, fleet manager for the, for the city. Um, he manages basically all the seven or eight of their different. What does the police cruiser do if it has a breakdown at Elkhorn? Do they have to go to 15th and Jane Street to get a tow truck, or I mean, are you participating? Is it mutual aid kind of stuff or not? Absolutely. If it if it was something where it was an emergency situation where they needed well, to get something like that, it's not an emergency. Not emergency. No, they would they would use their contract to tow service to take the cruiser wherever it needed to be, okay. wherever they needed it taken to. Okay. Okay. Thanks. What about hybrids? I'm sorry. Are we doing anything or looking at hybrids, CNG or electric? <clears throat> We have one hybrid um, in the fleet now, and we have two C and G. They are all three Honda Civics. And I don't know if you recall, a couple of years ago, I did a, I did a cost analysis on them, and it was we were paying triple the money to buy the vehicle up front, and we were getting the exact exact cost per mile to maintain those vehicles throughout a seven or eight year. The problem is with a C and G or a hybrid, your real cost profit or return is eight to ten years down the road. Well, we know vehicles don't last that long in Nebraska just because of the roads and the rust and all those things that go into it. So based on that, I saw no significant savings and actually it was about, it cost us more in the long run as a county to operate CNG or hybrids. Well, I, I borrowed a car to go up to the girls reformatory with Judge Daniels and I didn't realize that when I tried to get gas on the way back it was like I mean, it was the strangest combination. It was like 90% uh, corn and 5% uh, gas and 1% cod oil or something. 
I mean, I'm telling you, I had to drive to three different gas stations, and I finally found some place that had about five pumps, and they were weird. This was this, and this was that, and I thought, oh my God, I finally got the car filled, but whatever it was, it was a Chevrolet, and I, it was a fine car, but I was so surprised by the strange mixture. So, I mean, I think you're right to just go with the something else. Did, did you do that to punish Mike? Yes, he yeah. did. I don't believe so. Stop borrowing. I, I don't believe so. I think we're very first. accommodating. We'll, we'll give you some <laughs> ideas for next time. Yeah. <laughs> it was a car you bought a bolt. What's it that? It wasn't a bolt. It was a car no, you bought. No, it was bought. not a bolt. It's a Honda. Okay. Honda. No, we, they were all Hondas. Yeah. The hybrid and the CNG for all Honda Civics. And, uh, but they weren't totally electric. They were gas no. and electric. The, the hybrid is, to, the, yes, one yeah. is total electric. And one and the two CNGs are totally uh, CNGs. Now the highway has bought some dual, dual fuel, where you can run it in lead, and there's a switch to switch it over and run CNG. And I can tell you, looking at the fuel airports, that 90% of the time it's fuel, it's getting unleaded because it doesn't. There's no operate place to go. Right. So there's no stations yeah. for it. Right. Who's got those? Uh, the engineers. Yeah. The engineers. Okay. Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. This well, year, there's like 531,000 for. What, and how many vehicles will that buy? The, uh, if we stay on course with where we're at, we're doing about 27 vehicles per year. And that is, um, if I look at a certain department and I see that they had a Malibu in the past and they're generally using one operator, they're not taking three or four people, well, I can save $3,000 buying a Focus to do the same job that they were using a Malibu. So it's cheaper to operate it, gets better gas mileage, and it's the least, least expensive car. So this year we did 27 vehicles. Uh, with so you're the turning the fleet quicker. Huh? Absolutely. So let me ask you, do you, do you uh, uh, not buy radios and other stuff? I mean, just come and aim at them. You don't even buy any of that stuff? Is it totally stripped down, or what do you do? Because there's no, no they, they, there are a lot of options that you can add on based on a state contract. But why, the, why would you do that? I mean, as far as if there's no turnover, what, why is the reason? It used to be that you buy a car that was halfway equipped so you can have resale, but you're not reselling these. No, we are. They're being auctioned. Oh, yeah. we, we put them on public surface and sell them. And actually, we're more profitable doing that than we were doing the in-person auctions at the yeah. garage. I guess what I'm saying is I don't think anybody buying a car at your auction is going to say, oh, has it got a radio? I don't want it if it doesn't. I mean, I think people don't care. I could be wrong. Marianne? Can, can we go back to the CNG for just uh -huh. a second? Because when that was brought, um, Actually, we were right in this room uh, when Mark Doyle came. Commissioner Tusha had yeah. him come, um, and we talked about that. There was also talk about a station being placed at the engineer's office so right. that it would make more sense. That is that no that, longer on the table. I, I don't believe so. Okay. I know that we did have discussions about that. Um, I, I met, had lunch with them broke down numbers on what it costs us to buy vehicles, kind of like I've explained here, as far as from a cost perspective. Um, I know that uh, in order to get a standard slow fill station, which is something that have to get hooked up and run overnight to fill a vehicle up, it was about a million dollars. So when you figure in, that's really not gonna do us any good, especially if they're looking for the roads equipment and that right. stuff. Yeah. And, and there was just a lot of discussions. The, the engineers said they had no interest in purchasing CNG fuel uh, dump trucks yep. or anything like that because if you make it a public station then you start running into problems with roads getting cleared because it's a CNG truck and yep. they have priority or crew uses the pump and it just kind of died off and, and was never really okay up. I just never knew where it went well I think MUD was planning on putting one in front of M's pub but that kind of blew up <laughs> 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 oh wait a minute I had that tape <laughs> I can't do it <laughs> Oh my. It's live. It's broadcast live. Uh, <laughs> we've been here long enough. What's the last one? <laughs> All right. I think we touched on the budget already. I think uh, we did uh, Yeah, we. Okay. Yeah, okay. So let's see. Um, uh, so we have <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Does anybody have any questions for me? We're light seeing. Oh, we'll sorry, it didn't work out. Well, uh, I have two questions, one for the garage and one for purchasing. Um, do you, is there any way you can use any of those yeah. government forfeiture funds to service and maintain county vehicles? 
Then down that road. The sheriff. The answer is if the sheriff says if the sheriff said yes to it, then there is a way to do it. But the sheriff has said no, so this the the way the rules are written, it's exclusive within the sheriff's purview how those monies are spent. Okay. Yes. But Absolutely. and his forfeiture money is way down. I yep. So I don't think that's a real viable option yep. right now. And uh, for the purchasing department, is the city now paying uh, sufficiently to cover their, their costs? They, um, their well, fair share. Yeah, I mean, I would say probably right now where we are with the interlocal and have been conversations uh, with, with folks here within the room. That, I would say probably no. Um, I don't know, again, I don't know all the details of what else was traded in addition to just the purchasing departments and other park land and other things that were involved that I think was part of it. But when you look strictly about what I'm getting paid in terms of revenue from the city, and if I take that uh, percentage of time I'm spending in, in my department against city projects, it's not equal. So how do you well, that? Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Staffing. Are you able to hire techs? Okay. I mean, there, there, there's not enough mechanics around in the world right now. Are you staying staffed all right? Uh, I, I had a number retire over the course of the last couple of years. Um, I am. I, I I've okay. got some folks that have left very good jobs that um, were looking long-term retirement benefits and all those other things and. And it's been tough, especially when we kind of ran into that union and what steps and hiring and all that. Um, you've got a guy that's making sure. you know, 25, 26 dollars an hour at a dealership and you're asking him to come work for you for $22 an hour and pay eight and a half percent and pay for it. It, it was tough, but um, I think that we've got a real good group there now that, sure. that um, seem to enjoy what they're doing and, and are efficient. So. Very good, thank you. Who is your union? That particular union for the mechanics is the Teamsters. Okay. Mr. Borgeson? Well, I kind of want to go back to Doug's question because I didn't realize that, that we weren't, we weren't where we should be on getting what we should be getting from the city. Right. Well, I think, yeah, I think it's basically from my perspective, I mean, in the last five years where I've seen we've had folks retire the way the interlocal was written, basically city employees were, after two years, were considered loaned employees that were being reimbursed, uh, purchasing county purchasing right. was reimbursed in the city for their salary and benefits. After they retired, then I could replace them with county employees. So in either right. case, it's coming out of our pocket. Um, the other side of it, in terms of how it was written at the time, back in 2004, I'm not sure <coughs> the dollars and how those were figured out, if that was equitable. I mean, based on pure numbers that. right now, it's not because, you know, we're paying, you know, you know our salary, so, you know, basically 90% of our budget, we're getting about Roughly fifty thousand, one hundred fifty thousand dollars back from the, the city every year between the mailroom uh, reimbursement and a, an employee in the print shop. Okay. So it's Mr. something that it's probably requires more discussion. Certainly. Commissioner Kraft has a statement. I want to say that this doesn't mean that we all agree with what he's saying. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you want to. Uh, wasn't the city taking over the parks? They Part did. Yes. Yeah. Right. We made out on that. At yeah, the beginning, I, yeah. When you balance the two, I think we're coming out ahead. Yeah, and I don't, yeah, like I say, I don't know all the details in the background. I just the repairs of the pumps at Heartland Park. Yeah. yeah. Let them yeah. eat it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 350000 yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I think we've made... Yeah. Yeah. Moving forward, I guess, just from a pure mm -hmm. financial perspective and what I have to manage in budget and the workload right. that I have, it appears that they're getting a really good deal on the purchasing budget. Right, okay. on the purchasing department, but not on the parks. Well, what about, is there something being done to remedy that, or is it just a done deal? Well, I mean, I mean until the interlocal is, I guess, addressed, I think there's right. not much we can do. Well, I think we ought to be talking about it. I mean, I, my own feeling is, this is way off the beam, which is not unusual, but it seems to me that offices like uh, the assessor's expenses and, um, uh, you know, the um, uh, treasurer's expenses, that we ought to be able to uh, uh, charge or have political subdivisions participate in their operations because just the assessor's office, while it's in some uh, confusion right now a little bit, uh, they are the ones who produce the tax revenue for the city. So you know we ought to say, okay, listen, you got to chip in something because we're doing all the valuation for you. Uh, the treasurer, I think they balked at paying us a percentage to collect money. We really need to open up some talks with them about contributing because uh, they're freeloading on a lot of these things. And one of them may be free on purchasing. 
So can all the city employees and start over. <laughs> That's already done. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments, or uh, uh, statements? Mr. Kraft, one last chance. Okay. Thank you. Um, right, great. Good, good job. Awesome. Good job. Thank you. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last but certainly not least uh, is environmental services. Um, a little snapshot before I serve, turn it over to Ken. Uh, and as a little subsector of them is the, the landfill too. Uh, environmental services has 21 uh, employees. Uh, their current budget is about uh, $15 million with about another 250000 at uh, the landfill for maintenance. Uh, their budget status is 65% spent at 83% of the year, so there's not going to be a supplement there. And the landfill is 96, but that's a timing issue. That's just how they uh, do their purchase orders, so there won't be uh, an issue there either. Uh, but the thing to see is that the projected revenue at the uh, landfill is about 16.4. And the thing we also have to remember with the landfill, it's probably the only county department that kind of operates as a, a profitable business on its own, it, that it earns about a 8 to 9 percent gross margin. So, uh, you know, having greater expenses usually means greater revenues there. So, so that's a good thing. So that's something we always keep in mind and when we look at uh, the landfill is that it is a actually a profit center within the county uh, and uh, their uh, payroll is about a million three so most of their uh, expenses are not payroll related uh, well, that'll turn it over to Ken so I'm hoping I pulled the right file down it here it looks like maybe I didn't um, No, I managed not to. Okay, um, I will. Uh, I will give you the information. Uh, the, the, Can the I graphic, help you? I'm, I graphic, know how to do that. No, so the, graphic, the graphic. The graphic is. Not that important. Uh, basically, the the environmental services department covers five functional areas. Uh, the landfill is the biggest component of that from a revenue standpoint and also from an expenditure standpoint. Uh, land use planning, building permits and inspection, stormwater permit administration, implementation, weed control, and landscaping and snow removal operations. Uh, we have 20 full-time employees, one part-time employee, and it ranges between 10 and 15 seasonal temporary employees. Um, just kind of consistent with, with the conversation that just got had regarding purchasing. Uh, we do have two of the 20, <coughs> 21 full-time employees are on loan to the city of Omaha uh, pursuant to the parks that are local. How many? Two. Two. Okay. Two. Uh, so there is approximately 143,000 revenue that comes back from the city reimbursing the county for those two employees' cost and benefits. Plus the balance. So. Yeah. There, there are days when I don't mind not <laughs> so, um, and Just in terms of, of kind of the, the, the goals and objectives uh, going forward, we are entering into a, a review of the, the county's comprehensive land use development plan, uh, which was approved by, by the county board in 2006. The plan is basically going to stay the same in terms of the priorities and, and, and the functions of that plan. But a couple of the of noted items that will be added, uh, you, you heard Audie talk a little bit about local food production and, and things like that. So uh, we are going to shore up the comprehensive plan with, with some definitions and use types that relate to local food production and also address that in terms of, of where uh, in the county particular land uses might might uh, be compatible with that. And there are also uh, elements of, of solid waste management that will be added into the plan to uh, to shore up the definitions and the use types and so on. And that will all be consistent with, with some of the things that are, are mentioned in the in integrated solid waste management plan that was developed through MAPA a couple of years ago. Um, 
in terms of solid waste management, uh, we're working in collaboration with the City of Omaha, MAPA, and other uh, metro area entities to, to basically look at, at all aspects of solid waste management uh, consistent with that integrated solid waste management plan uh, that, again, was developed through MAPA in 2012. Uh, obviously, solid waste has been in the news lately. Uh, I briefed the county board uh, a few weeks ago on, on some aspects of that. Uh, there continue to be uh, discussions. Uh, the, the city of Omaha is, is entertaining right now a potential contract for a, a study dealing primarily with yard waste and how they, how they would handle that, but it will also deal with, um, uh, I believe, some of the, the aspects of collection and trying to automate the collection uh, uh, using carts instead of bins and things like that. So uh, there's some of that discussion going on, and then there's also some discussion that that uh, our department has had with the county attorney's office just looking at, at uh, other potential aspects of, of solid waste management, how we can move towards a more sustainable system. And some of the things that, that come into play here uh, is just the dynamics of, of what has changed over the past, I, I would say, 10 or 10 plus years. And that is the, the amount of uh, solid waste that's generated here that's actually going to, to other landfill locations. Uh, the Integrated Solid Waste Management Act that was passed in the early 90s by Nebraska set up a system of regional landfills, and there are 23 in the state right now. And we have probably the, the biggest landfill resource uh, in the state, maybe in the country, I'm not, not quite sure. But uh, a lot of landfill space, airspace available, and a lot of life, projected lifespan. Uh, but there are also issues of, of more waste uh, continuing to flow out of the county uh, so, so we are, are looking internally at, at some, some potential, um, I don't say solutions, but, but some opportunities there that, uh, that we come back and, and present to the board at, at some point uh, that, uh, that I think just moves us down the road towards a more sustainable system where uh, it, it addresses the revenue question a little bit, it, it addresses uh, recycling, it addresses diversion, it, it addresses to some aspects the, the yard waste issue and composting and, and, and landfilling, et cetera. So uh, there will be some of that additional things coming forward, uh, I, I would say probably in the next couple of months potentially. Uh, we're waiting on, on some additional research by the, the county attorney's office on some things related to that. Our stormwater permit administration, uh, we continue to implement uh, that particular permit, a uh, number of different items there. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, I've done this past year is to hire a part-time stormwater assistant, and she is primarily tasked with doing outfall inspections and assisting in some duties that were assigned to the building inspectors with the upturn in building permit activity. I've had to take them back off of that, and, and they're, they're dedicated full-time now to permits and inspection activities, which interact with the, um, with the stormwater stuff, but um, uh, it's, it's primarily building permit related. Um, one of the things that we are also doing there is, is heavily uh, implementing technology. Uh, we, are the, we are the counties, from, from a county's perspective, we are the largest by far user of GIS services. Through, through our GS department. Uh, all of our IT things are coordinated through .com. Uh, we have uh, utilized very significantly uh, the CityWorks work order management system. We have all of those those things tied in with uh, the city, uh, city source apps that the public has, and we have the workflow set up so that when we, we have a report from a, from a citizen, that goes directly into the workflow and we don't, we don't have to have somebody transcribe an email, we don't have to transcribe a phone call, voicemail, anything like that. It goes right to the workflow and gets assigned to the right person. Uh, it's worked really well on the city side too. They use it fairly extensively in their parks department as well. So, so that, that particular uh, um, enabling technology is, is really uh, closely tied with GIS as well. So we can see all this stuff from a from a map standpoint. Um, Can you use that for potholes? Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. 
Uh, that's, I think, that's probably one of the, on the city side, that's probably one of the most heavily used reports is, is to report potholes. And it, it captures your, your location right away, too. So um, it's all right there. Um, those are those are the primary aspects I joke I think they get overview of, of kind of the revenue and so on so um, I'm gonna do it at that and answer any questions you have. Joe you have a question comment? Well Karen actually pointed out to me but under stormwater permit administration it's you talk about evaluating the use of drones for oh. outfall inspections ah. to increase efficiency. Right. Yes. right. Well yes one of the one of the things that we have we have used drones uh, at the health center to do some, some canopy uh, uh, low-level uh, photography. Uh, but one of the things that we would evaluate for outfall inspections is to uh, contract with a, uh, with a service that would uh, allow us to go and, and fly into areas along creeks um, to minimize the, uh, uh, the time expense for, for doing that with, with on-field personnel. And uh, that, that's still in the evaluation standpoint. Um, we haven't decided whether to, whether to pursue that or not. We uh, contract, though. Yeah. We're not, yeah. We don't own one. No, okay. I'm not, I'm not going to buy one. Okay. We've, we've gone down that road already. OK. No. One, one of the, yeah. No, you heard. Well, I, I didn't read that far. I was still writing things about low impact development, here, but, which I'll ask you about. But anyway, no, the, the drone deal is that you know we're going to require every department and elected official to come to the county board and publicly talk about uh, drone usage. And uh, I personally don't want to see us have flown any drones until I do either. And we really have to have reputable companies doing these drones because uh, they're going to have to have low food insurance that just you know, names us as primary insured, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so anyway, that's my thoughts, and I'm glad uh, you caught that. It's going to go on your record, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> no, we had, we had run that through the through the uh, county attorney's office. Did you? Yeah. Well, I'm glad they told us. Uh, <laughs> Ken, I'm just interested. What, what, what's the what's the what's the outreach program you do at Miller Public Schools? Uh, the outreach uh, program at Miller Public Schools is something that's just in its infancy right now. I've had uh, some discussions with some of the assistant superintendents and, and, and folks that are involved in the in kind of the science curriculum, uh, primarily at the elementary school age. Are you piloting and, something? Yeah, it, w it would be a. A pilot uh, that that we're again still trying to develop. Uh, the basic idea would be to uh, utilize GIS technology at individual schools. Uh, we would uh, uh, basically go in and and, and do and it's, it's almost like a uh, an engineering analysis, hydrology type analysis uh, and drainage that a, an engineer would do all on a on a very simplified scale that the students would be able to do. Uh, they'd be able to then potentially design some of their own stormwater projects. Um, I'm sure you just mentioned LID, so yeah. that would that would be a potential fix there. Designing rain gardens and things like that that, that might help solve some drainage problems right on the school. That engages the students. It engages some of the parents. And the thought is that rather than directing a lot of what has traditionally been done with stormwater education towards parents, you direct it towards elementary school kids and let, let them bring it back up into the house, into the parents, and, and do it that way. Can you, you feel you can just take one pilot on and on? Well, uh, we, we will find out, I think, fairly quickly whether, whether they're interested in going forward with it right now. Uh, I can tell you that if they're not interested in going forward with it, then I'm, I'm probably going to approach OPS. No, yeah, let me that. Let me know. I'm gonna, yeah. I got a potential. Commissioner Morgan, and then yard yes. waste. The city, yes. you're working on that. That's going forward. Uh, the city is is going to entertain a contract. It sounds like with SCS engineers uh, to do a lot of, of work in the landfill roof, landfill area, and they're going to assess. My understanding, at least at this point, the scope of their study is going to be to assess the, the relative benefits of composting versus landfilling yard waste. That, that's going to be a major piece of that. I know Marty said, you know, they wanted to try to do the yard waste billing, but they're kind of studying it now is what's taking place. They, they want to. So they haven't made a decision, really. 
Right, and, and part of part of that is going to be their evaluation of their existing composting Omegro operation. Because in 2020, they're going to have to relocate that. If, if it's going forward, they have to relocate that because there's a major plant expansion for that wastewater treatment facility in 2020. Okay. So, so something's going to have to happen if they're well, going to keep go us updated mm -hmm. and let us know your expertise about advice. Okay. And I, I just had a question about sure. um, do we have a commercial tire recycling facility in Nebraska at all, or how do we handle our tire recycling? Um, the, the tire stuff is all handled by the private sector. Okay. Uh, nothing on the public side. Okay. Uh, you will see when you go into any place to get your tires redone, uh, they're going to charge you a tire fee, mm -hmm. and that's part of the disposal process. And but it doesn't end up in our landfill. No, tires are specifically banned from landfills. Thank you. Mm -hmm. no, okay. I have one. Mary Jane asked one question. I have two. Um, on this environmental services department relocation, you talked about that last week too. It says public meeting space will facilitate public use and enhance security. Is that for the public public meeting space or just for county employees? Both. Oh. Both. It's primary. The, the, the safety and security issue that we have in our current facility is that is we, we don't have any separation yeah. between public oh, yeah. space and, and, and office space. Uh, it's very difficult to, to maintain some of the, the security aspects that we should have. And that compromises, at least from, from my perspective, both both employees and the public coming in. So that's something that, that we feel very important. Uh, it is very important to the new facility. And the way it's being, at least the concept is put in place, that those those spaces will be physically separated so that it, it, we can ensure, better ensure that the safety of, of both employees and the public. The public is people coming in to do, <coughs> to do business with the, with the departments. There. With the department, and also it would be public meetings such as uh, the Planning Commission and Zoning Board of Adjustment and other, other public meetings that would not necessarily be just meeting with staff. And my last question uh, are you coordinating anything with the local NRD, like suggesting dry dams or anything as an alternative for? large dams they want to build? Uh, we have a lot of our own own stormwater related things that, that relate to our stormwater permit and the, and the requirements that are within that permit. Um, we do some coordination with the NRD in terms of, of uh, floodplain administration. Uh, we have, have some joint things going on with them. Um, I just got notice, I mean verbally haven't seen in writing yet, um, I applied for, for a grant for one of their cost share programs uh, that we're going to use part of that funding for a project at the health center. Um, so yes, there, there's some coordination there. The but they're not center? about to ask us for advice on flood control. We have a slightly different philosophy. No. Let me, uh, anybody else yeah. questions? I'll yeah. ask about that. Yeah. 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 I wanted to ask you, uh, if I about low impact development. We're still committed to low impact development, right? I mean, we're not trying to take a walk on that. No, that's it. If you look at the comprehensive development plan, okay. the low LID and green infrastructure is a big component of that. Okay. Um, there's no, there's no uh, move away from that at all. All right. Then I want to ask you about the uh, the permits and the inspections uh, section of your office. Mm -hmm. um, my impression has always been, and then the sheriff comes in and sets me straight about there's 70,000 people out in the county outside the city, and so I assume that's the same people you're serving with developments and all the rest of the building permits and all. Is that right? That's we serve we serve them. We also have an interlocal with the city of Bennington, so we handle um, their permits inspection. We also, we also do Waterloo, and we do right now all of the electrical permits for Valley. Great. And that so we have we have we're leveraging some good resources there. Uh, we bring in a fair amount of revenue. Okay. Um, in the past couple of years, it's been going up. Uh, I put a fairly conservative estimate on revenue going forward, uh, but um, I, I'm guessing you're okay as long as I come in over that. Uh, <laughs> Let me okay. ask a question about trees. There's this uh, beetle thing coming in and destroying all these uh, 
elm trees and so forth, whatever they are. Ash, do we, Ash, do we play any role in any of that in tree planting or removal of trees? Um, we we have done and, and will continue to do significant amounts of tree planting on the properties that we own. Okay. Um, continue to do that. Um, I've been very active in past years in the Nebraska Arborist Association, right. um, and I have contacts there. I mean the. The, the other thing that we've done on our property is that we've tried to identify where we have potential susceptible ash trees, and I've been systematically removing those. Uh, we only have a couple of large ash trees left on the uh, uh, health center campus, for example. We have a number of them out at the, the Fitzgerald home, and we'll do, be doing an evaluation of those later this month, and we'll identify which ones ought to go, which, which ones should stay. Earlier on in your initial presentation, you talked about snow removal. Do you get involved in snow removal? Yes. Okay, why, why don't you use the uh, Tom Doyle's operation for snow removal? Um, we don't really have the same kind of needs there. Um, we use some of our own staff and we use a contract for uh, snow removal the health center and some of our other properties. You come all the way into the health center to remove snow? From where? I don't know. Where are you? Yeah. Where, that's where we're located. What's, what's that? We have a little office at the health center. That's where our staff is located. Goodwill right? building. Yeah. The Goodwill that's building. Staff is yeah. located. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For the for that so, snow removal stuff, yeah. Right. What's that? For the snow removal stuff, they're located. Well, it seems there. to me. I mean, I know that everybody wants to do their own thing, but it seems to me that you know we ought to be talking about um, um, you know the city doing some snow removal and we trade them off and we do the stuff out west and vice versa. I just you know, it reminds me of the Central Park Mall or Leahy Mall, you know, where it used to end at 10th Street and the county had it on the other side. It took four votes to get that turned over to the city, but uh, that was a classic case of, of uh, uh, I think, a screwball operation. But I, I'm not saying it's a screwball, but I think we need to we need to start focusing on things that we just can't have our own deal. I mean, the fire department used to have its own snow removal service, too, and uh, uh, that's gone, I think. But anyway, uh, this is some place that makes me a little crazy where we're doing our own thing. I think there are efficiencies that we could have if we contract with the city to do it, for example, or out west with uh, the county engineer and surveyor. That's just my comment. I intend to pursue it if I can. Mr. Barkson? Well, I love you, Mikey. I, I really do. But, but, but. Sometimes, you know, there, other people can just do it better, and snow removal is one of those that I think can be done better. <laughs> you <know>. And so <laughs> we could talk to the county engineers about it I and don't think see. The county, was, the county engineer wouldn't be doing 42nd Street. Well. You know, but the county engineer would be welcome at Elkhorn, believe me. Yeah, that's and true. I don't have a problem with that. I, I know. That's, that's yeah, true. Great. I mean, the that's sheriff true. would be welcome out there, too. That's true. So, I'm just giving you a hard time. I know. You, you still love me? I do. Okay, good deal. Any other questions or comments? There's your pen. Did you want to make a statement? <laughs> so there is development taking place west of 72nd Street. That's just what I was confirmed. Yes, absolutely. Do you want to drive out there with me someday? <laughs> I'll show you. Well, I have to stop. Can we stop and get food a couple times? Absolutely. Yeah, good French, French we got lots of good restaurants out there. I'll pay for the gas if you leave them out there. <laughs> <laughs>